a while, you're going to think you're ready, you're ready to go, and then you're going to mess up. And what do you do, Matt? You got to get back up. You got to try it again. You got to get back up. And even oh. if this happens again, you got to get up. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated. You know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> okay, so the Cabo Fest registration is going faster than we thought. There's still some spots right now, but you probably want to go ahead and grab a spot if you haven't. Now, let's learn about diagnosing pneumothorax with ultrasound. Oh yeah, so with the pneumothorax, you're gonna to wanna to use your linear probe. You can definitely use the curvilinear probe if you want, but the linear probe has a higher frequency and so, and so it's gonna give you a better image. Now, when you place this on the patient, you wanna place it actually in the more most anterior part of the chest wall. Now, Matt, when I learned, I always learned that you have to start in more spaces two and three all the way up here. Now, look at the shape of this chest, air, if it's outside of the lung, it's going to go in the most anterior portion of the chest. And if they're laying down flat, it's actually going to be closer to down here, not in room spaces two and three, like uh, many of us have been taught. There's a study that was done here. It actually wasn't necessarily an ultrasound study. What they did is they took CT scans of a bunch of patients that had pneumothoraces and found that the majority of them were in this area right here. So regions 9, 12, and 11, not in this area over here where we tend to think about it. So I usually start down here. On the left side, it gets a little bit tricky because the heart gets in the way. So I try to find the heart and just go one room space above that to be the most sensitive. Now, if you have a patient that's hypotensive, they're crashing, they're dying, I honestly only look in the anterior chest wall. But if you want to have a thorough examination, and if you have time, you really should look at the entire anterior chest wall, this whole area right here. Right. And, and it's, it's good to make that point. If we're talking about an EFAST and the hypotensive patient, it doesn't matter quite so much because if right. it's causing the hypotension, you're going to see it just about anywhere. But when we're talking about these smaller ones we want to find in the intubated patient, it's good to know where the most sensitive area is. Exactly. Now, here is what we're looking at. Now, remember, the probe has to be in the sagittal orientation because you want to see those ribs in cross section. Sagittal, up and down. Up and down. So here's your rib. you got a rib shadow underneath it. You have your intercostal muscle in between. You have your skin, subcutaneous tissue, and muscle. And right there, that little, see that little sliding right there? I see it. That's a VPPI, or the visceral parietal pleural interface, is where you see the visceral and the parietal pleura sliding relative to each other. So you need to focus on this little white line right here and you're asking yourself, is there sliding or is there not sliding? Now I know you like graphics, Andy. And you say sliding. Yeah. I don't really see a lot of sliding there though. That line looks like it's maybe shimmering to me. I well, don't really like the term sliding. I think to use the term sliding, you have to know what's causing this shimmering and it's sliding that's causing it, but it doesn't really look like sliding to me. Well, I like to describe things a little more as to exactly what's happening physiologically. It definitely, people have described it as shimmering. People have described it as ants marching. But I like sliding just because to me that reminds me of exactly what's happening. Now, Matt, I know that you stay awake late at night. I do. Because of lung ultrasound. And so I made another graphic for you. So up here, we have the parietal pleura, which is stuck on the ribs. And here we have the visceral pleura, which is the lung. And what we're seeing is we're seeing that visceral and parietal pleura sliding relative to each other. You see that right there? Yep, makes sense. Now, what's important is that it doesn't matter if a patient has pneumothorax or not, that is gonna look exactly the same. The question you wanna ask yourself is, is it shimmering? Are there ants marching? Is it sliding? That's what you want to ask yourself because the image is going to look identical if you have a pneumothorax or not. Now, do you what see- What do you mean the image is going to look identical? This right here. Above it and the white line. There's and you, still going to be a white line. Always there. going to be a white line. And it's just, is there shimmering or not? Right. So let's look at this right here. You tell me, is there shimmering on this side? Do you see I don't shimmering? see any shimmering. Me neither. What about over here? Is he shimmering or sliding? Clearly shimmering. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that over here we have a pneumothorax, and if that visceral pleura is one millimeter beneath the parietal pleura, you're going to lose it. It's not like you're going to see those two things, the space between the two of them separate. It's either going to be sliding or it's going to be not sliding. There's not going to be a black area or anything representing the pneumothorax. Nope. The only time you might see that is if you actually have fluid in between the two. But if you have any air separating those layers, you will not be able to see that visceral pleura. So lung sliding is one of the ways you can rule out a pneumothorax, but there are a couple of other ways. You can actually use something called the lung pulse. You actually talked about it earlier, and you can use beelines slash comet tails as well. 
Now, Matt, I want you to look at this plural line right here, and I want you to tell me if you see a whole lot of sliding or shimmering or whatever you want I don't really say. see any shimmering. There's really not a whole lot, but I want you to look at these little things right here. You see these little things coming down here? What are those? Comet tails. Yeah. Now, there's a, kind of a subtle difference between the comet tail and the beeline. Now, a comet tail is like a beeline. It doesn't extend all the way to the bottom of the screen, and a beeline should extend all the way to the bottom of the screen. So it's kind of semantics a little bit. Comet tails are not really of huge clinical significance other than in situations like this. Comet tails and beelines only come from the visceral pleura. So what does that mean? So like that why does that help us? The visceral pleura is against the parietal pleura, which exactly. is more anterior, exactly. if we're seeing it. So there's no air between the two. Exactly right. So if you see comet tails, you see beelines, it means the visceral and the parietal pleura are actually touching. Now I want you to look at this image right here. Do you see a lot of good sliding, a lot of shimmering, a lot of ants marching? I mean, I kind I kind of do see shimmering. I know I don't I don't see sliding back and forth, and I think I know the point you're getting at just uh -huh. looking at this image. Well, what do you think? So I see movement back and forth, but it's not a lot of really sliding. It's more like a pulse. So yeah. I bet this is a lung pulse. Exactly. What will happen here is the heart, as it's beating, will transmit that movement through the pulmonary parenchyma, get to the visceral pleura, and if the visceral pleura is touching the parietal pleura, you'll see that movement of the heartbeat. And this actually correlates. If you look at, actually measure the pulse, it'll correlate exactly with this. And this situation where I see it the most is when you have, um, maybe you have an intern, maybe it's like the second or third intubation, and I just shove that thing all the way down. You'll see you're four centimeters deep on the right side. You'll oh, see. You're really excited. You're really excited. Um, you look Means, on the right yeah. side. You have great lung sliding on the right side. On the left side, you see something like this. Do not stick a chest tube into this patient. Pull the tube back just a little bit till you see good sliding. Exactly. Now, Matt, beelines, lung sliding, and lung pulse all will rule out a pneumothorax in the area that you're evaluating. Do you think the absence of those things will definitely rule in a pneumothorax every time? No. Does it, did you say that just because of the slide and you saw the slide? Mainly. So there are things that cause the lack of lung sliding besides a pneumothorax. Have you ever heard like a really bad asthmatic, like, like you have to intubate this asthmatic? What do they sound like? There's just no air movement. There's no air movement. They're so obstructed that there's no lung sliding. Effusions, consolidations, adhesions. If the pleural layers are stuck together, they're not going to slide. We already talked about mainstream intubation. And if a patient's not breathing, they're not going to have good lung sliding. Fortunately, there is something that will rule in a pneumothorax. What, what do you think it is, Matt? Would that be a lung point? It is a lung point. Now, it has been described as 100% specific for a pneumothorax, but when you actually read the studies, this is a whole other podcast I could do on the lung point. Basically, it's not 100%, but it's very highly specific for a pneumothorax. It's specific enough that if I see this, I'm very comfortable in the right clinical setting that the patient actually has a pneumothorax. Now, Matt, I don't think I've ever shown you this graphic, but I want you to walk us through what's happening here. So we've got a CT scan there. It looks uh -huh. like there's a pneumothorax right. on what, the right. Right, exactly. So where do you, where do you want to put the probe first? Well, if we put it anterior, what will happen if you see we're anterior? We're going to see no lung sliding because there's air separating the visceral and parietal pleura. So we have that pleural line. We see no lung sliding. Boom, Excellent. Got it. Now, where do you want to go next? Let's go posterior and see what lung sliding looks like. So posterior, the visceral and parietal pleura are together, and you see sliding back and forth or shimmering. Right. If you if you would rather. What now, do you see here? Half the probe is over the pneumothorax, and half is over the area where there is not a pneumothorax, we have a lung point. So Excellent. as the patient breathes Strong in work. and out, that lung, that lung will expand a little bit each time as they breathe in, and the area where the visceral and parietal pleura come together changes and moves with those respirations. Absolutely. Excellent. Now, when you're looking for that lung point, I mentioned that you have to stick that probe in the sagittal orientation or up and down when you're looking for a pneumothorax. But when you're looking for the lung point, I found it's easier to go transverse and look in between the pleura. You actually find it a little bit easier that way. Now, what about M mode, Jacob? A lot of people talk about M mode and a lot of people hate on M mode. What do you think about M mode for pneumothorax? So, uh, so what M mode is, is a graph. It's time on the x-axis and then distance over the y. So it's how stuff moves along this line right here. And the theory is if you have this plural line right here, if you see this kind of sandy beach appearance, it means that the lung is actually sliding. So the visceral and parietal pleura are together. And if you see no real change here, so like a barcode or a stratosphere sign, it means that there is a pneumothorax. So there's not good lung sliding. And this is, this is this kind of how I feel about it. I just don't think it's useful. I think the only time that it's useful is if you have a situation where you have to document that the patient had the lack of lung sliding and you can't record it. So if all you have is like a thermal printer, then this might be useful. 
in my experience, this actually confuses me more than helps me. And it tends to confuse the learner as well more than it helps the learner. But if you want to do it, you can go ahead. But I don't think it really is useful. You don't, this does not confirm a pneumothorax or the absence of lung sliding when you already saw it on your 2D imaging, on your grayscale imaging. Yeah, I think this is totally an artifact of back in the day when we were right. saving images with thermal prints and we needed confirmation that this is a pneumothorax and we couldn't see the shimmering because all we have is an image. Right. I think this is, I think we totally would not do this if we started doing lung ultrasound today for pneumothorax. It messes you up more than it helps you. Agree. We're going to agree to agree. We're going to agree to agree on that one. Matt, what is, what game is this? Is this pitfall? So there's a couple of pitfalls. Oh, I see what you did there. With lung ultrasound. And this is one of them. So tell me, Matt, what do you think about this plural lineup here? Do you think it's sliding or not sliding? What, what's your thought? Let me, let me do it one more time. I think it's sliding or not sliding. What would you say about it? I don't really see much sliding, but okay. I see maybe some comet tails coming off possibly. Okay. I don't know. There's some weird stuff going on. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Now, what do you think this circular structure is right here, this thing? What's is that? Is that a subplural consolidation? Nope. Mm -mm. Mm. Try again. This is a, let's play it again. All right, I don't interpret stills. All right. I like it. I like it. Let's play it one more time. All right. Let's see. Let's coming see. Down, coming down. What is this? It's circular. Circular. Uh huh. It's right beneath the pictorial muscle, right here. It's very is it a rib. Yeah, it's a rib. And this is why it's actually so important to start with your examination with the probe in a sagittal orientation because of this. Now, let me ask you a question, Matt. I know it's been a long time since you did anatomy in med school, but where is the pleura in relation to the rib? I feel like it's right below it. Right, and this is right above it. What do you think this is? Oh, so that's not even the plural line. It isn't the plural line. It's something else that's air-filled, that has air in it. What is it? Is that just subcutaneous air? It is subcutaneous air. If you see what you think is a pleural line above the ribs, the patient has subcutaneous emphysema, and that will actually block you from seeing the pleura. If you see the subcutaneous emphysema, unfortunately, your ultrasound is going to be very not useful. Well, useful. I mean, to be honest, you've got a pretty good answer about what's going on if you see subcutaneous air, right. but yeah, but you, you can't, can't actually see the lung. You though, can't right? actually see the lung. You can't tell if they have contusions. You can't really tell well if they have pneumothorax. They probably do, but you can't make any kind of diagnosis other than the patient has subcutaneous emphysema. And this will actually get in your way with the FAST exam as well, because sometimes when you have bad subcutaneous emphysema, it actually get into the abdomen. You won't be able to look at the abdominal organs as well. The other thing is this, bandages obviously if you can't get your ultrasound transducer to that area you're not going to be able to evaluate it granted most of our patients don't come with this kind of impressive looking uh, bandage here but you got to think about it in kind of code situations you don't want to move that defibrillator pad what does a bandage have to do with will's cigarettes i'm super confused by this image yeah i got nothing i have no idea either All it's right. just it was just there it's just it's here bandages but you don't want to move the defibrillator pads and know that you're not gonna be able to evaluate any area that has something on the skin where you can't get your transducers sound beam to that area the other thing is just bones the ultrasound gets uh, the sound from the ultrasound beam itself actually gets absorbed by bone and so if you want to evaluate a bony area let's say behind the scapula or in between the ribs or beneath the sternum your ultrasound beam isn't going to be able to get to it very easily or at all because of the properties of bone now, Matt, when I tell people about this, they're a little skeptical at first. I mean, they see, I show them the literature, I show them how easy it is, but they've not done it before. So they're kind of uncomfortable because let's say they've done one, they, they ultrasound it along and they said, this is definitely cartagenic pulmonary edema, but it turns out it's a pneumonia or it turns out it's ad atelectasis. And they ask me, what do I do in that situation? And what I do is I just look at this very inspiring video on YouTube. So imagine this young man with this neon green shirt is the practitioner who's just starting out to use lung ultrasound. And let's say these little bars are a diagnosis. Every once in a while, you're going to think you're ready, you're ready to go, and then you're going to mess up. And what do you do, Matt? You got to get back up. You got to try it again. You got to get back up. And even oh. if this happens again, you got to get up. You got to do it again. And there's a, you caught it that time, right? right? But even if you fail, you still got to try it because understand that once you figure this stuff out, <laughs> it's going to be useful and it's going to help you save the lives of your patients. So a little difficult maybe at first, but I would encourage you to just go out there and do it. Actually, the best way that I learned lung, lung ultrasound when I was an intern is I would find patients that I knew had a certain disease. So patients that I knew had cardiogenic pulmonary edema, that I knew had pneumonia, that I knew had a pneumothorax. Then I take the transducer back 
the ultrasound machine back and actually scan them. And that's actually what helped me mostly when I was starting out to decide what was what. Yeah, that's key. You don't have to trust your diagnosis the first time you do this or the second or the 100th. You can trust your diagnosis once you reliably see that your abilities match up with these sensitivities and specificities we've talked about. Once that's happening, then you can trust it when you need to. But take your time, go slow, and once you've got it, then you've got it. All right. (laughs) That's right. Deep words from Matt Dawson. Once you got it, you got it. (laughs) Folks, you heard it here first. If you're getting it, you got it or something. I don't know what the hell Dawson's talking about. All I know is they seem to be doing a lot of this newfangled lung ultrasound in Kentucky. So what the hell did we learn in this last episode? Well, first we learned that what you learned may very well be BS. And I don't mean over the last 16 minutes, although that very well may have been BS too. But what Jacob is telling us is don't start your pneumothorax ultrasound evaluation at rib spaces two and three. In a supine patient, start lower down where the chest is more anterior. Next, Jacob tells us that when it comes to diagnosing pneumothorax, uh, there's our go-to sliding that we look for, which I think everybody knows about, but it's also important to remember things like beelines, comet tails, and a lung pulse, which can all rule out pneumothorax as well. Now, when it comes to diagnosing the pneumothorax, the best thing you can find is a lung point. Start anterior, identify the lack of sliding, then look posterior and see if you see sliding. Then look transverse and look for a lung point. Uh, I'm not sure if you followed all that, but basically the point is you're looking for the freaking lung point. A lung point is pushing 100% specific for pneumothorax. This is really the key to diagnosing that pneumothorax. Now, a couple other things. In mode sucks and watch out for sub-Q air. That sucker's tricky. All right, I think that sums up our lung ultrasound talk. Thanks for listening. When you're ready to learn some real ultrasound, check out our prior podcast on cardiac ultrasound. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.